Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. Music is more important than notes. Also, notes doesn't equal music. What do I mean by that? Well, it has all to do with non-note musical elements. Just before I get into that though, I wanna let you know about my free masterclass called The Best Way to Create Melodic Solos. It's a 40 minute video masterclass that dives into my simple six step voice leading process. And by the end of it, you're gonna instantly be able to implement it and improve your playing right away. It also includes nine pages of PDF worksheets that go along with the masterclass, and those are completely free as well. So go down to the top of the description down below, click that link and start improving your playing today. So now let's talk about non-note musical elements and dive deeper into them. So when you are active listening and trying to pick those elements out, you'll have more of an understanding of each one of them. Phrasing. This is so incredibly important in any style of music that you're playing. How are you actually playing these lines of improvisation or melody to create proper phrases over top of the chords or the rhythm section or whatever. Phrasing in jazz improvisation should be approached the same way you have phrasing when you speak. Listen to the great speakers, how they give speeches or just how they talk, and you can get a sense of what phrasing works in certain situations and which doesn't. Remember, all of this is basically subjective, okay? So I'm just gonna give you ideas of what each one sounds like, you're gonna think about what each one sounds like and what emotion it evokes in the listener and to the other performers and yourself. And then you're gonna choose the best possible outcome for you in that situation. So if I was to talk like this and not really give any commas and not really take a breath and just kind of keep going and try to give you information, I could still fit all the information in here and be pretty quick. But it might be hard for you, the listener, to digest and understand the information I'm giving you. Certain times you might want someone to speak very quickly and get through it. If you're an auctioneer somewhere, you ever hear them, they speak super, super fast. That's gonna be different phrasing from someone giving a speech because they were class president or they just got accepted at a new job and they had to speak to a bunch of people. I, I don't know, you get the point. Different phrasing works in different situations, but certain phrasing in jazz is kind of universal and it gives you a sense of Oh, this works here. It gives the listener a chance to, to breathe. It gives the band a chance to respond, different things. And we're gonna dive into that specifically right now. Phrasing can be really described as when are you playing, how much the intensity is growing or subsiding in a solo. There, there are definitely more elements to it than that, but basically how much is someone playing? Are there a lot of notes be happening? Are there held out notes happening? Is it really intense? Is it really quiet? When are they having that ebb and flow? We're not really talking about the exact dynamic level or the exact articulation yet, but all of that goes into phrasing. The best way to learn anything is transcribing or emulating what someone does. You can do this with phrasing. Transcribing doesn't only have to be writing down all the notes and articulations and dynamics and everything that someone plays. You can just transcribe someone's phrasing. Now, how do we do that? The idea is this. You're going to take a piece of paper or you're gonna write it on a digital device like a tablet or computer or whatever, and you're gonna divide it up into however many choruses or however long the solo is. For example, if somebody does a two chorus solo, maybe just divide the paper in half, then you have chorus one, chorus two. It helps to know how long they play for ahead of time so you can plan this out for spacing reasons. Then what you're going to do is in real time when listening to the soloist, you're going to chart out on that piece of paper or that device, literally their phrases. It doesn't have to be super exact. The idea we're doing is giving ourselves a visual representation of the solo. After you're done writing down the solo, you should be able to hand it to someone. They can tell where the high point of the solo was, where the low point of the solo was, if they use a lot of space, if they played a lot of notes. The way you'll do that is literally as they're playing, as the soloist is playing, if it gets really intense, you're gonna go up on your list. And it could be an arbitrary amount. You don't have to actually break it off into an X and Y axis to, to specifically, but as it gets more intense, you're gonna go up. As it comes down, you're gonna go back down. If there are some spaces, like rests, you're gonna leave spaces. If they use maybe a lot of pointed articulation, like uh, staccatos and marcatos, maybe put some dots. If they play a lot of notes, you can color it in, kind of whatever you want. The idea is, once again, we're literally mapping out just the shape of their solo. I call it a shape transcription. You know what? We're gonna do that together right now. 
All right, so now you're inside of the PDF that I created for this shape transcription. As you see, we're gonna be doing Sonny Rollins solo on St. Thomas. Now this is a very classic, very famous solo. If you haven't heard it before, you're in for an incredible treat. And if you have heard it before, like most of you probably have, we're gonna be going through it now and really picking apart what the shape of the solo is. So in real time, I'm gonna be going through and writing down on this sheet, each chorus, where the high points are, where the low points are, where the rests are. If you notice here, chorus one from left to right is here, chorus two, chorus three, chorus four, and chorus five. I went ahead and marked that down ahead of time. I know that it's five choruses that we're gonna be transcribing. I would love it if right now you would all go get your own piece of paper and a pen or pencil or a tablet or something to write on, because I think it'd be awesome if we did this together. So pause the video right now, go grab that and come on back. And if you don't want to do it together, you don't, you aren't able to right now, no worries at all. Watch as I do it and you'll understand how this process works. And then you can apply that to any solo you want. That's the great thing about this. All we're focused on is the shape of the solo and the shape and intensity of the phrasing. We're not worried about what key it's in. We're not worried about how difficult it is. We're not worried about how many notes they're playing. We're not worried about all that stuff. And those are the things that when you usually transcribe, you're worried about. You're, you're taking you know four hours to figure out one measure and this and that. This, you're getting so much out of it. The goal at the end is also not that you're gonna take his solo here and then you're just gonna emulate that every time you play St. Thomas or any other song. The idea is that you're gonna visually see what the shape of this particular solo looks like. Then you're gonna decide, do I like that? Do I like those certain spots that he does? Would I change anything? And the great thing is if you know, man, at the beginning of that third chorus, he did this, but I think it would have sounded cooler or better if he did this, now you know. You know exactly where he was headed and the shape of it, and you can then go the opposite way or change it or do the same one or whatever you want. You now have that flexibility and those options to make it any way you want when you improvise. We're gonna get into this. We're gonna listen to the song. We're gonna write through it. I hope you write along with me. If not, just enjoy it, and uh, maybe yours will come out just like mine. If not, that's okay. But we'll be hearing things a little differently, but hopefully it's somewhat close to what I have written here. <laughs> What do you think about the way I wrote this shape transcription? Does it match what you wrote? If it doesn't, that's okay. But I'm gonna give you my thought process when going through this. So he starts out, beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up. One of the most iconic ways to start a solo, right? And he's just playing some space and, and kind of, you know, softer, but kind of these little short stabby phrases. And by the way, just because he plays low in the register of the instrument doesn't mean you have to actually mark it low on the PDF here. Low just means low intensity. He happened to be playing low in the instrument and also soft and, and separated. But low, you could play really intense down low as well, and I would, I'd be writing that up here. So it's not 
definitively one thing or the other. Just in, in general, he was playing lower here in the beginning. Then he had this little flurry where he went up. Then he comes back down, ends the first course, starts the second, the same way he started the first. Then he starts building up with another flurry and then another one that gets a little more intense. Brings it back down to the third course. Some more spaces here, these little little phrases. Da -da 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 -da. But it, right, only a couple notes at a time, but he's adding more. You feel that intensity kind of building towards something. He takes another rest. Then at, towards the end of the third chorus is almost the highest point of the entire solo. He comes in with this high line. He kind of goes, plays over the bar line, as you see here, going into chorus four. Then he kind of plays a bunch of phrases roughly around the same intensity level. Shorter phrases, but not as short as the very beginning, you know, a few notes here and there, he's building it up, down, up, down, some rest. Then he ends the fourth chorus with a bunch of short notes. Then he starts the fifth chorus. That's probably the highest point, I would say. Some might argue actually here in the third chorus it was the highest, but once again, it's not an exact science here. It's just kind of the way I interpreted it, was it was building towards this fifth chorus. The most interesting thing to me about this solo is look where it ends. Ends all the way up here right? It started way down here. A lot of solos follow a traditional kind of story arc where you start down low, you build up, build up, build up for, you know, 70, 80, 90%. And then the last 10, 20, 30%, you bring it back down. Nice, calm resolution. This solo sort of starts that way, right? It starts going up, 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 up. And then he ends it there. And so it's interesting in that solo, I mean, not only do I want to hear more because his solo is just that great, but also the intensity is still going. I thought he was going to keep going, you know, the very first time I heard it. And I would have loved to hear more. That right there is a great example of not following that traditional arc. So when you're improvising, you have to think about what does that say to the band and to the audience? If, if you're the last soloist and you're going back to the melody, that might not be the best solution because you have to go back to just playing boat up, up, but up. Maybe you don't want that intensity that high. But if you're handing the solo off to someone else, for example, that might be a great way. It Look at this, the shape of the solo. It might be great to hand them off with that higher intensity and they can then take it from there and see where it goes. The main thing that I hope you got out of that exercise is not only that you can use that exercise on your own for many different solos, but it gives you a nice visual representation of what you're hearing. And then you can look at it as a snapshot, the entire solo in one shot and say, oh, here's the high point, here was the low point. Here's why that solo felt a certain way, phrasing wise. I hope this exercise opens you up to new possibilities when listening, transcribing, and practicing. The great thing is you can use this exercise for any solo or part of a solo that you want in any style. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions about this or if you've tried this yourself, I'd love to hear how it worked out for you. Once again, be sure to click the link at the top of the description down below to get my masterclass, The Best Way to Create Melodic Solos, and corresponding PDF worksheets completely free. If you have any other ideas for topics you want me to teach you, please let me know in the comments down below. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.